Hi, I'm Bishop Daryl Hines, and I want to take this time to invite you to be a part of a very powerful service that we've just experienced at Christian Faith Fellowship Church. It's entitled Praise in the Park. We went outside into a park, and the saints of God came together. The choir sang in a large number for the first time since COVID, and it was a wonderful time of sharing. Of course, God gave me a very powerful word entitled, What Would Jesus Do? And we spoke to the issues that we're facing today. So I hope you enjoyed the service as we enjoyed it. Be blessed by praise in the park.
Brother Tony, but that's all right. When praises go up, blessings come down. The Bible says that God has formed us to give him praise. For this people have I formed for myself to give me praise. And whenever I think of that scripture, I think that God has put running in our feet, clapping in our hands. He's given us a voice to say, Lord, we thank you and we praise you and we honor you. You see, praise is the vehicle that brings God into the habitation. That's where he lives. And when you begin to praise God, I want you to know that miracles begin to happen. You see, Paul and Silas, they had the secret to praise. Even in their darkest moment, the Bible says at midnight, they praise God. And the Bible says that an earthquake came and the, the, the chains were loosened because of praise. We're in dark situations right now. But I guarantee you, if we do what we're called to do, somebody will hear the praise. Their chains will be loosened. Their darkness will be turned into light. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I want you to know that whenever you're gathered in the name of Jesus, the Bible says that God is in the midst of a people. That means when you come together, where two or three are gathered in my name, we're gathered in his name. The Bible says that he's in the midst. That means he's in the middle of the gathering. So since he's in the middle, we give him praise. We give him glory. We give him honor. Only God, only God could have a blue sky. Look at the sky. With a white cloud, a yellow sun, green trees, only a good, gracious, and loving God can do such a magnificent thing. We take it for granted, but I want you to know that it's God, and he's blessed us today to be together. I thank God for you. I thank God for seeing you. It's a blessing that you're still here. You're walking in health. And I pray for those that have lost loved ones due to COVID. God said, I am the Lord thy God that healeth. He will heal the broken in heart. So we pray for those that have lost loved ones. But right now, today, while we're here, we're here to give God praise in the park for his goodness, for his loving kindness, for his tender mercy. Let's put our hands together and give our good God praise. God bless you, Christian faith.
Whatever it takes, I'm all in. Whatever it takes. Choir, thank you. And then before we go any further, I just want to thank God for those who have been making sacrifices with the choir sang today. And they also sang this morning. And then we have certain choir members and praise team leaders who have been, you please be seated, they have been in every service. We did not stop having service today. I mean, this during any of this. We just changed how we had it. I think Shauna has been in 99% of every service training and teaching. Thank you so much in choir rehearsals. And then there are others that, uh, that have been in just about every service. And we appreciate you. We thank God for you. And we want you to know that your labor is not in vain. I'm going to go to the word of God. I have a challenging word in front of me. And uh, I think that it's necessary for me periodically to hear God and speak concerning the present day that we live in and say some things that will bring clarity and understanding to his body. The church has an awesome responsibility. The Bible says that we are the salt of the earth. In other words, we give the earth perseverance. Pres perseverance. Salt is a preserver. It keeps you. The Bible says that we are the light of the world. Light gives direction. So the church has a responsibility to preserve and to show direction to Jesus Christ. And when we face such challenging times as we have over these last several months, periodically we need to speak to the church itself and give the church specific understanding that you can't get from CNN, NBC, ABC, Fox Network, or any other news source that you go to. We don't take away and stray away from the word. We give you, bring your attention back to the word. So I want you to get your Bibles. If you use electronic Bibles, get them. It's going to be difficult to see it with the sun. But it's important that you're reading with me because I'm going to do a lot of reading. I hope the choir is prepared to help me at the end of this. I want to appreciate them again. Let's go to Hebrews, the 12th chapter. And we will start reading at the first through the third verse of the book of Hebrews, the 12th chapter. Then I'm going to read the verse and then I'm going to pray for the word. The first verse says, Wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which do so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. The second verse says, Looking unto Jesus the author, and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Third verse, for considering him to that endured such contradiction, for consider him that endured such contradictions of sinners against himself, lest ye be weary and faint in your mind. Again, to a second verse says looking unto Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and it's set down at the right hand of the throne of God we minister from this past of scripture message entitled what would Jesus do father I thank you and I praise you for this time of sharing as I minister this word let it bring clarity into the hearts of every hearer let it answer questions and enlighten us for the time that we live in. Speak through me for your glory. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Again, my topic for this evening is, this afternoon, what would Jesus do? We are facing some challenging times. You don't need me to tell you that. As a matter of fact, it has become so pressing, negative things and all of the fighting and the back and forth and the indifference and the fear and the death until it almost becomes overwhelming. Uh, just a few weeks ago, I decided to stop watching the news. Now, if you know anything about me, you know that I watch the news every day. But a few weeks ago, God just put it in my heart that I need to stop because it was too much. And I couldn't allow what I was hearing on the news to start leaking into my messages. And so sometimes you just have to pull away from some of the stuff that influences you over and over consistently. 24 hours a day you can find news, whether it's through your electronic devices or some network. 
telling you things over and over and over and over until it's drilled in your spirit to feel a certain way, to think a certain way, to act a certain way. So many times we become controlled by what we hear. I'm not saying that be the case of anyone listening to me. But we're told how to respond to circumstances. We're told how to feel about circumstances. We're told how we should think about certain things. We're told how we should feel about certain people, how we should think about certain parties, what we should think about certain situations. We're told no longer just the information, but we're giving the influence of what to do about it, which is different than just telling me the news because now it comes with the connotation of what you feel about it and then it becomes something that you impose upon me, which is your feelings and your desires. Well, as believers, how are we to respond under these circumstances? What are we supposed to do? When we live in this world of trouble and we have the same situations that our neighbors do, when we have to go in the same environments and have to hear the things that are spoken every day to come against your faith. Well, you have to remember one thing, that your total and complete response to world's situations and the chaos that we face has already been addressed by Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Your actions, your attitudes, your knowledge, your verbal responses, all of them have already been put in place by Jesus. Why do I say that? Because the Bible declares here in the book of Hebrews, Lord help me, I feel like preaching outside. Let me just stay focused. It says here in the book of Hebrews, it says now, we have so many witnesses that have compassed about us. Now, you have to know what the 11th chapter says. It says to us, faith is the substance of things, hope for the evidence of things not seen. For by faith, the elders obtained a good report. Then it starts bringing attention to all of the patriarchs that have been faithful to God in the Old Testament where the word of faith itself, F-A-I-T-H, was not applied to them. I'll talk about that in just a moment. So the book of Hebrews, the 13th chapter, records the patriarchs and the great acts of faith. So it tells you that there are people who have experienced prior to you some of the very things that you're going through. There are generations before you that have had to face some of the very same things that you're facing, and they are witnesses now in heaven who now understand And if that not be enough, it tells us that we look past them to Jesus because Jesus came completely everything we are to deal with everything we be. Help me, Holy Ghost. He became everything that we face so he could give us a way to face it. The Bible says, first of all, he is the author and the finisher of our faith. Now, you got to recognize that when you speak of the author, it's the archaeogos or the architect. That's where that word comes from in the Greek. And it speaks to the one who is the chief author. He is the principal, the leader, the prince, the one who takes the lead in anything, thus affords an example. He is the predecessor in the matter that we face. He is the author, the originator. So our faith starts with Jesus. He started it. He is the originator of your hallelujahs. He is the originator of your peace. He is the originator of your joy the originator of your salvation he is the author but not only is he the author he's the author and the finisher now you got to get that in your spirit because I'm about to get happy on my own preaching you see to be the finisher that word tells us then that he's the one who completes the one that is the consummator the finisher One who has in his own person raised faith to its perfection and so set before us the highest example of faith. So Jesus is not only the beginning or the originator, but he is the example of faith in its complete action and it is completed in him. The author and the finisher. So there isn't anything That we as people of God face that his faith hasn't covered. You see, that's all he is, is the author and the finisher. See, faith isn't complicated. It is not a complicated subject matter. We know that the word of God is faith. Because the Bible says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was made flesh. So Jesus was the word in the beginning, so the word is faith. 
We understand that. Comes by hearing the word of God. So we know that Jesus is the author and the finisher. And when you look at faith, you will find out that the word faith is in the Bible 231 times, but it's in the Old Testament only two times. And it represents exactly what Jesus is. Woo. Let me show you what I'm talking about. When the Bible speaks of faith in the Old Testament, even though it doesn't use the word but two times, it's understood that these words are significant. First of all, you will find the word faith in the Old Testament in Habakkuk, the second chapter, the fourth verse. It says, behold his soul, which is lifted up, not upright in him, but the just, that's the second time, the just shall live by faith. The first time it's in the Bible, it's in Deuteronomy 32 and 20. It says, and he said, I will hide my face from them and I will see what their end shall be. For there is a, for, for, he says, for, for they are a forward generation in whom there is no faith. And so what happens in the Old Testament, it speaks of no faith and then it speaks of living by faith. So before Jesus, there was no faith. And after Jesus, we live by faith. It's a simple application. Let me keep on sharing it with you. When you go to the New Testament and look at all the other times that the word faith is used, there are only two Greek words in the New Testament that translate faith. The first Greek word is pistis, and it means persuasion, or it means a man's conviction. The second word faith is olipistis, and this word really means an unwillingness to accept. So either you accept it or you don't. You are persuaded by it, or you're not. Let's keep on looking at the examples. When Jesus speaks of faith in the New Testament, he only speaks of two types of faith. He speaks of, of, of little faith and he speaks of great faith. When Peter began to sink on the water and Jesus saw him sinking, Peter cried, save me, Jesus. Jesus stretched forth his hand and said, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And then Jesus speaks of great faith when the woman who was persistent in her coming to Jesus, after the disciples said, turn her away, Jesus even said, it is not meat for us to give bread to the dogs. But it was this woman that says, yes, but the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And Jesus told her, great is your faith. The Bible tells us in James, there is dead faith and working faith. So faith isn't complicated. As a matter of fact, it's hard not to live by faith once you know what it is. Because there is not an error in living by faith. You either do it or you don't. You either have it or you don't. You either obey it or you don't. He started it and he finished it. And so when we're facing what we're facing in life today, and we're dealing with what we're dealing with, we don't listen to CNN. Or we don't listen to world news. Or we don't listen to the gossip columns. Or to the likes that are on Facebook. But we have to know what did Jesus say we are to do. Why? Why? Because we walk by faith and not by sight. We live by faith. The just shall live by his persuasion in Jesus Christ. He shall live by faith. And so when we look at the categories of challenges that we face, the first question that we ask is what would Jesus do about politics? We seem to be in a very, very difficult time and season of politics where one party is speaking negative of the other party, where some of us who are born again believers have a defensive posture if we say the wrong thing about your candidate. You know, I know, y'all ain't got to say amen, I know. Where you have become some of the ring leaders in certain persuasions that really have nothing to do with God. Because we feel that we are bound to have to be a part of the society and speak with the ruling society are those who seem to favor some of our social convictions. So what would Jesus do if Jesus were here and he looked at CNN and saw one president candidate and then another one and the fighting and the bickering? What would Jesus do? Well, he was in that situation before. Isn't that amazing? Jesus 
was going about God's business and they tried to trap Jesus with a question. Now listen, I'm only going to stay in the word. So if you get an attitude, get an attitude with his word. Because that's I'm staying in his word. Well, there was a situation that Jesus himself found himself in. When you go to Matthew, get your Bibles, the 22nd chapter. Let's go to the 15th verse. It says, then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entrap him in his talk. And they sent out to him saying to him, his disciples with the Herodians saying, master. Now they call him the master. We know that thou art true and teacheth the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? And I'm using the King James Version Bible for the last year because I've been finding some of these other translations. They done watered it down. And I'd rather work through these these and thous and thus saith unto thee than to have something that ain't even in the Bible put in something I'm reading. So let me just go on. It says here, so y'all put up with the these and the thous. It says, tell us therefore what thinkest thou? Is it lawful? We're in the 17th verse. To give tribute unto Caesar or not? Do you give tribute? Do you recognize Caesar or don't you? Trying to trick him. Look at what Jesus said. Bible says, but Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, why tempted ye me, you hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. And he said unto them, who is the image of this superscription? They said unto him, Caesar's. Then he said unto them, render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's and unto God the things which are God. And some of y'all said, well, that ain't no answer. It is an answer. Jesus didn't get caught up in the political uh, rhetoric that they were trying to put on him. Because if he had said, well, you owe it all to God, they would have went to Caesar and said, Caesar, this man is teaching people not to respect you. If he would have said it all goes to Caesar, they would have turned around and said, well, what about God? So what Jesus says, whose picture is on the money? It's a man's picture on the money. Well, what this man requires for you to have his money, render it to him. Now somebody said, well, that ain't enough answer for me. Well, I ain't through. I'm just getting started. So let's keep on reading the Bible. Because when you go to the book of Romans, the 13th chapter, the first of the eighth verse, it is made perfectly clear how we're supposed to respond. Whether it is a Republican or a Democrat. You give the Republican what's rendered to them or the Democrats based on whose money is on or picture is on the money or who's in authority. Now, why do I say that? Because Romans, the 13th chapter, the first verse says, get your Bibles and turn with me. So you won't be leaving this park saying, then guess what else he said? It says in the first verse, let every soul be subject unto the higher power. For there is no power but of God. The power that be ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resists the power, resists the ordinance of God. And they that result, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works. You just keep doing what's right. Resist, resist it, the ordinance of God. Uh, let me read that again. He says again, I, I want to get back because I'm going to lose him. Because you can't really see because the sun is so bright. But I'm going to see here. It says, let every soul be subject to the higher power of the first verse. Let's go to the second verse. Who therefore resists the power, resists the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Wilt thou then be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. Fourth verse says, for he is the minister of God. To these, to these for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God. And revenge to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore you must need be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For, for this cause pay ye tribute also. For they are God's ministers, attending continually up on the very thing. Seventh verse, render therefore to all their dues, 
tributes to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Owe no man anything but to love one another, and he that loveth one another hath fulfilled the law. Do you hear what the Bible says? It says, who's ever in power or whoever serves in authority, you have a responsibility to do what's right because you say. That's what God's word says. You may not like it. He says, but you do what's right and it'll work out good for you. Jesus said, give Caesars what belongs to him. Don't become someone who's bucking against the authority. I know you don't want to hear it. Y'all done got quiet as a church mice licking ice out here. But it's the truth anyhow. When you talk about who we are, we don't just show up in a situation with the rhetoric that is being uh, rehearsed without knowing who we are. You are born again believers. If it's trouble, you bust in the midst of it with prayer. You give encouraging words for people to be counseled, to find consolation with God. We don't get on the rebellious side. I'm telling you what the word says and start fighting the authority and saying crazy stuff because we don't like it. God said, you do good. Jesus says, you render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. That's how you deal with political issues. You find yourself in obedience to God's word. You don't like everybody who's in authority. You know, I didn't always like my daddy. But I obeyed him because he was in authority. You don't like what's in authority, then get to voting. Vote them out. But if you don't get who you want out, don't start lying and talking crazy. You're saved. And you got to do what saved folk do. You got to render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. I didn't say it. His word says it. Now, you're going to leave here with the problem. It will be with his word because I'm going to stay in the Bible. I'm going to do more reading this evening than y'all heard me do all month. So let's keep on going back to the Bible. So what does Jesus do when faced with political dilemmas? He do what's right. He doesn't become rebellion and resistant. Somebody said, well, if you don't resist, then you won't get changed. But let me tell you what Jesus said. Jesus said, render to Caesar the things that Caesar's. And what do we find out from that? That God gets on your side when you do what's right. And God is still in control. We forget, we forget that we can pray and change the foundation of this. We forget who we are. The fervent, effectual prayer of the righteous availeth much. And if you will call on God when something is oppressing you and tell God about it, instead of talking about it, tell God about it. And God will do something about it because we serve a God that knows everything. Jesus is the author and the finisher. He knows everything you're facing. What does Jesus say? And I know it's warm, but I'm the one preaching under the sun, so stay with me. What does Jesus say about the abuse of power? Because we know there are those who get power and then they abuse it. They don't know how to use it properly. Some folk don't need no power. They need to be set in a corner by themselves but that be not the case some folk abuse power so what did jesus do when he saw power being abused get your bible go with me to matthew 20 and 20 and 28 then came him to the mother of zebedee's children with her two sons worshiping him desiring a certain thing of him let's keep on going and they ask in the 20 verse, 23rd verse, he says, uh, uh, ye shall drink indeed of my cup and be baptized of the baptism. I'm, be, I'm moving quite quickly through this. But G, they came to Jesus and wanted a seat on either side of him. He called them unto him and says, ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them. But they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the son came not to minister unto, but to minister, not, not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. So Jesus is talking about rulers 
and he's talking about people in authority like like uh like uh governors and and mayors and police officers jesus says when you see the abuse of it you know it ain't me now i'm gonna tell you what you do now just stay with me he says the greatest among you are supposed to be servants so the attitude for christ when you have people who who rule uh, uh who abuse power he says that that should not be named among us because we are ones who serve so when you see people abusing power you begin to pray and rebuke the devil because that's not god's way now some of us say what do you mean because that's the enemy that's what the devil does he gets lifted up in his power and he needs to be rebuked you see the world is doing what they do but what is the church doing we should be saying, Satan, the Lord rebuke you. We come against your kingdom of darkness. We take authority over your treachery and your tricks because the right way is the higher you get, you are to serve and not to exercise authority over people. That's what Jesus said you got to be. He said, I didn't come to exercise authority. I came to serve. So you start being servants in here. Start serving the kingdom of God. Finding a way to communicate what God wants in the attitude of service. You can serve, you can march, you can do what you do, but you got to do it with the right attitude. When you marching, man, you round there saying, the devil, you beat, I bind you in the name of Jesus. You know, out there threatening folk. And I'm not saying that'd be the case. But we got to remember who we are. So Jesus says those that are the greatest, they're servants. And so when people are abusing power, we can rebuke that. And we can plead the blood of Jesus. And we don't have to tolerate that. But we have to respond with a servant's heart. We have to become servants. That's why it's so important that we don't sit back and just allow folk who are living for the devil to get all the positions. Somebody got to be saved on the council. Some got to be saved at the table. Y'all looking at me funny again. Let me keep going. Jesus, how did he deal with racism? Ain't that a good one? Because we're dealing with it now every day. Racism didn't just start. It's been around a long time. How did Jesus deal with racism? Let's go to John 4, 9 and 19. Come on, get your Bibles. And I want you to make notes of this because you're going to need this to help other people. How did he deal with racism? Now, if y'all posting me, stop. I'm going to post me when I get ready. So don't be posting me. So you can record me for your own private needs, but don't post me now. I'll post this the way I want it posted. Thank you so much. Jesus, how did he deal with racism? Let's go to John 4 and 4. Look at what Jesus says in the fourth verse. He said this, I must need go through Samaria. Now why would Jesus have to tell his disciples, I got to go through Samaria? Samaria was the quickest way to Jerusalem. It was only 30 miles north of Jerusalem. Jesus said, I got to go to Samaria. Well, the Jews didn't fool with the Samaritans. They hated the Samaritans and they disliked Gentiles. I'll say it again. They hated Samaritans and disliked Gentiles. So the Samaritans weren't the only ones on the prejudiced side of Jews in the Bible days. But Gentiles were non-believers, people who were not Jewish. Now, they had a special load for the Samaritans. And the reason they did was because they were in Samaria, and when they were carried into captivity into Babylon, then they repopulated the area with people from the captors. And uh, they kicked it, Jerusalem, I mean, Israel was no longer in the land. So the Samaritans took their land. But the Bible says lions came and started eating them up. And so they sent for some of the priests. From, from the Jews to come and teach them the ways of God to stop the lions. And instead of them taking completely the rule of God, they mixed it with idolatry. So the Jews hated them and disliked the Gentiles. Jesus said, I got to go through Samaria. Oh, read the story. He went through Samaria and there was a Samaritan woman. Not only was she a Samaritan woman who the Jews hate, but she was a sinning Samaritan woman. She had five husbands and tried to hit on Jesus and Jesus had to tell her that husband you got ain't even yours. And then she said, you must be some prophet or something. 
Jesus said, if you knew who I was, you'd be asking me for some water. Jesus began to tell this woman everything she knew about herself. She began to talk to her, and I'm just paraphrasing. I won't read it all for you. Jesus had to go to Samaria. This woman marveled at Jesus. He began to tell her about her life. She dropped her water pots. She ran into the city, and she told the Samaritans, come and see a man who has told me everything that I've ever known. Is not this the Christ? When she found Jesus, Jesus went to where she was rejected. He went to the rejected area, went amongst the rejected people, went amongst the people that were suffering racism, and he ministered to them, and the whole town came out and saw Jesus because Jesus knew if he never mixed with them, he could never save them. And I'm trying to tell you that the world tries to put separation between races and genders. Y'all ain't got to like me, but I'm not finished. He put rep separation between races and genders. That's why we have, the Bible says in Colossians, 3 10 11 it says I have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him that there neither is Jew or Greek or circumcision or uncircumcision or barbarian now barbarians were heathen they were rough people but then he goes on and says the sentience these were people that had no morals he says when it comes down to me I don't have no no difference between the heathens the folk who were terrible saved if they were black white yellow if they were male or female if they cursed me they act like they I don't have no difference I'm gonna go to all of them and I'm gonna get them to me because if I'm lifted up I'll draw them in the devil wants you to be separate because it cuts your witness off he wants you to be against each other because it cuts your witness off he wants you to be negative towards each other but it cuts your witness off Jesus against the advice of his disciples went to Samaria because somebody gotta go somebody gotta pull down the racist indifference somebody gotta do what Jesus said he did it didn't he Jesus dealt with racism he says there's no difference he says I come to the Jew and the Gentile he says when you come to me you're neither male nor female you're neither bond nor free you I find you in your worst state and I find you in your best state I find you on the other side of prejudice and I find you being prejudiced as people are prejudiced against you Jesus says you got to be able to go to them you got to be able to tell them Jesus is Lord told you this before and I'll tell you again God told me he says Daryl during this COVID you treat people just like you'll have an opportunity to treat to, to, to share Jesus with them I said what treat people just like before this day is over you'll have a chance to share Jesus with them I never heard that before and I wasn't treating people like I was going to tell them about Jesus at the end of the day. I wasn't speaking to folk. I wasn't fooling with them. I wasn't smiling at them if I didn't know them. I'm going to be honest with you. I didn't want them to bother me. I didn't want them to say nothing to me. I didn't want them to get me confused that I may have said something out the way or I looked at them funny. I just minded my own business. Then I realized I'm not about my business. I'm about my father's business. If I don't show them some kindness, who will? Oh, yes. Somebody put some damnable lies out on me. And I want you to know God told me when it came time for my vindication, don't even call his name because it ain't about making him the patsy. It's the devil. Let everybody know the devil is after anybody who does right. We try to condemn each other. I'm not trying to condemn that man who let the devil use him. I know it was the devil. I hope and pray he gets saved before over with. Now I had to get there. Because when I first heard it, I wanted, to, I wanted to call him and tell him a thing or two about Jesus. And it ain't what I'm telling y'all right now. But I'm telling you, when you really have the Holy Ghost, you find out what Jesus says do. And that's what you do. What about racism? What do we do about that? Lord, help me. What do we do about that? I'm, I'm just about finished. Prejudice. What do we do about prejudice? This thing, to see, I told you the devil getting electronic stuff. He tried to keep your electronic stuff. Prejudice. The Bible says that Jesus went into Capernaum and there was this centurion that came to him and said, pray for my son. My, my, pray for my servant. 
And Jesus said, I'll go home with you. He says, no, you don't have to go. If you tell him now to be healed, I'm a man of authority. And if you tell him to be healed, he'll be healed right now. Jesus said, I ain't seen this much faith even in Israel. Your son is healed right now. Jesus did not allow prejudice or racism. And this was not a Jew to keep him from doing what was right. I'm telling you all, I'm not touching this thing and it's going crazy. Just so y'all know, the devil don't want me to get this out, but he's a liar because I got it in my spirit. What does Jesus say about hatred? He said, you've been told love them that love you and hate them that hate you. But I'm going to tell you a different commandment. Love them that hate you and do good to them that despitefully use you. Bishop, you ought to stop now. We don't want to hear no more what Jesus would do. Just let me keep doing what I'm doing. But we need a witness in the earth today. Now, how do I know? Because Jesus' ultimate goal is for me to be saved, sanctified, baptized, and filled with the Holy Ghost. His ultimate goal is for me to come out of sin. So what did Jesus do about hatred? He said, you love them that hate you. He says, you got to be good to them that do you wrong. He says, you got to reward them that do you evil. Jesus says, you got to turn the table on them. I think I'm going to preach out here. Turn the table on the devil. And let the devil know that you picked the wrong one. I'm not like everybody you see who wear a blue jean suit. But there's something different on the inside of me. It's time for saved folk to stop playing saved. And start living saved. Stop acting like you know Jesus. And start living like you know Jesus. Because your faith has gotten you to where you are. Is there anybody here who's experienced some challenges in life? But faith got you to where you are. I can stand before you today and say the reason I can testify about the goodness of Jesus is because my faith that was complete in Jesus got me to where I am today. You see, Jesus first dealt with my sins. For the Bible says he delivered unto you first all that also that we would receive. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture and he was buried and rose again on the third day according to the scripture so he first dealt with my sin he saved me from the gutter and put righteousness in my heart and then he gave me a faith to look at that when the devil told me I wouldn't have his word said I'm the Lord thy God that giveth thee when the devil tried to take my life with lightning somebody prayed and God stepped in and worked a miracle you see I'm not just talking about what God can give me but I'm talking about what God has done for me just two years ago I was diagnosed with cancer and I had to go through all I had to go through radiation treatments and the devil would come to the radiation board when I was laying there receiving the ray and said you're not gonna make it he said you know cancer is a killer and you're not gonna make it what about your testimony that God is a healer tried to take my faith away and make me doubt the power of God but what I love about faith faith will find you where you are and I begin to say God is my healer and I'm gonna live through this and I want you to know there are no cancer cells in my body I look better than I ever looked before I can run faster than a man twice my age or less than twice my age I know I can run faster than somebody twice my age I can lift weight I outdanced y'all in here got more wind than I had in a long time in other words God turned it around and added years to my life and he said Daryl you're not gonna leave here until I do what I told you I was gonna do through you I'm here to tell you today that Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith when you feel you can't make it go to Jesus when you feel overwhelmed take it to Jesus is there anybody in here that he healed your body somebody hear me COVID attacked your body and you know that COVID is a killer but you're here today because God is a healer folk may look at you funny but I want you to know you are a testimony to tell somebody the author and the finisher of my faith is my healer and my deliverer church it is time for us to do what Jesus did. It is time for us to let our faith lead us. Stop listening to rhetoric and letting people lead us and say, for God I live and for God I die. Troubles may shake me. Friends may forsake me. But Jesus will never leave me. It is an amazing thing. It's 
an amazing thing to know that everything we face, Jesus has already dealt with it. Our faith has given us an answer to every circumstance. Our faith has given us the solution to every challenge. Don't allow the enemy with his fast talk and his overwhelming abundance of talking talk you out of your faith. I was discouraged when they told me I had cancer. I got overwhelmed for a moment. And I want you to know the devil could have won the argument if I didn't have someone who was wounded for my transgressions, bruised for my iniquities. The chastisement of my peace was upon him and by his stripes I'm healed. Somebody said, well, Bishop Hines, how does that work? Believe, have faith in God and God will change your life. Have faith in God and God will make the difference in your life. Stand to your feet, people of God. Hallelujah. Stand to your feet. It's not complicated. It's not complicated. Let me say it again. It's not complicated. The simplicity of faith is either you have it or you don't. We don't have to find others to agree with us when Jesus has already settled it. Sometimes you're going to be the oddball out when everybody is walking around with venom and hatred and you're saying, listen, we got to love them. When people are saying they ain't no good and you a fool to talk nice about them and you have to say, well, with love and kindness, I've drawn them. Somebody said, man, that man did you in. You should try to get him back. Jesus said, do good to those that hate you. How can we win the world if we are so influenced that the people can't see a difference in us from the world? You see, we've been saved from getting high, getting drunk, fornicating, things that are obvious sins. But if we hold envy in our hearts, hatred in our hearts, and we allow the enemy to make us have a difference for people because we don't like how they treat us, and hold on to those idiosyncrasies because it makes us feel good about ourselves. The devil is a liar. I don't like everybody I gotta love, but I gotta love them. Let me say that again. I didn't like Janet some days. Just so y'all know, Janet pushed me down so hard one time I almost broke my tailbone. But mama told me I had to love her until I started to like her. You see, you gotta realize that you can draw people to Jesus if you will live for God before them. Lift your hands, I'm going to pray. If you're here today and you are sick in your body, I pray the healing power of the Holy Ghost come upon you now and you be healed in your body. The Bible says he sent the word and they were healed. I pray that God heal you if you have been troubled in your mind and you have been struggling with fear. I pray the peace of God find you where you are. And I, I feel this by the Holy Spirit. There's some of you who have been very discouraged and you've been low in your spirit. And God told me to tell you to lift up your head and live. He got you this far and he's not going to leave you. Live through it and give him the glory for it. Because your end is not nigh. God has work for you to do. And God is going to add to you before he allows the enemy to destroy you. God's going to give it back to you if you've lost it. So look for it and rejoice in it. Know that your change is coming. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus. Oh, 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 oh Lord. Oh, Lord. Lord, you've been, you've been good to me. I was just sitting there thinking, looking over my life, and Lord, you've been, yes, you've been good to me. When I was down and out, didn't have a dime, you made a way for me, Jesus, and you did it so many times. Hey. 
at the ring. You've been a sister, Lord, you've been a brother too. Take me to F. this day and this time of sharing you met us here and you've been good to us